Yeah, it was weird. I remember my my mission president saying to me when I was there for those six days, you're probably not going to be able to come back. <laughs> like the, the likelihood of the church having you come back again is basically zero. But then we met again right before I went home. And right before that, he said, actually, the the area authority who was looking over your case, I don't know exactly how it works. But he said, he made an exception. He says that you can come back for a third time. Hey, Saints Unscripted friends and family and all you viewers out there who we love very much. Welcome back. We are with Stuart today. Um, this is going to be cool because lately I feel like we've had some people on who are sharing cool stories about their missions and just like every type of experience under the sun because there's a lot that comes with a mission. And so we're going to talk to you about your experience today. Um, do you just want to give a little intro just to... Uh, Tell us just a bit about yourself. Sure, I can give you the the quick Spark Notes version. Yeah, I guess. Let's see. I grew up in the church. I was baptized a member eight years old. Um, but when I turned about eighteen, I went off to college, and I decided, you know, church thing is pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where did you grow up? I I moved all over. I lived in Utah for most of my childhood, and then I lived out in D.C. Okay, and I went to school out there. And when I went to college, I was like, you know, it wasn't even like a conscious thing. I was like, you know, it's just waking up every Sunday was getting more difficult. And then I had no friends who were in the church. And then eventually mm. it just became a lifestyle that I wasn't a part of. And I was out of the church pretty strictly for almost two years. And then I had a realization that's like, well, I'm now in my 20s. I now have to decide what kind of life I want to live. I have to be more conscious of this decision and so I, I moved back in with my parents. I decided to try to go back to church. I decided to get reinvigorated with my testimony. And I went on a mission at 21. I turned 21 in the MTC. But I ended up coming home, I don't know, four or five months later. Where did you serve for those? That was um, the Washington Kennewick Mission. Hey, I'm from Hermiston. Really? Yes. <laughs> you are? I'm from Hermiston, Oregon. That yeah, is awesome. Is that mission. right by, is that near Kennewick? It's in the same mission, yeah. Oh, really? It's just oh. across the river. The, the the Columbia River is the border between Washington and Oregon, mm -hmm. and Hermiston is just like a little... Just barely on the other side. Yeah, yeah, a little bathroom stop. I could stare at it from one of my areas, but I never got to serve in Hermiston. Uh, you <laughs> missed out. We had a... The watermelon. We had a Walmart <laughs> Super Center. Wow. And a uh, Safeway. It's, I didn't even yeah. know those still existed. Great people. <laughs> Fantastic. Great people there. Yeah. Very small. Anyway, that's crazy. So, okay, so you never served in... <laughs> no, what, I, what, year, what year was this, by the way? So I, I went to the MTC in 2017. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I was there until the summer of 2017. I came home. The long version of it, I don't really have time to tell, but the short version is... I didn't feel like I was operating as a missionary at my peak capacity. Mm -hmm. I felt like there were there were spiritual gifts, there were spiritual abilities that I thought I deserved as a missionary, but I wasn't receiving because I wasn't as worthy as I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I came home, and I ended up being home for a year and a half, mm -hmm. which if you That's ever met stretch. missionaries who come home, the statistics of you going back out into the mission field after being home for six weeks is like just it drops. plummets. Yeah, and I after six months, imagine. it's basically zero. My stake president said, he, I'm the only missionary he's ever met who went back to the field after over 18 months. And so I went back and that what, was... Quick question. What helped you get through that? That long period? <laughs> well, I had a very profound spiritual impression when I was 16 that I had to serve a mission. I knew for a fact I had to serve a mission. And this was before I really took the church very seriously at all. But I I just had that, that very profound spiritual revelation. I had to serve. And that stuck with me for so long. Because when you're a little kid, you're the, you're the, you know, like Inside Out is one of my favorite movies. You know, those core memories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you have core spiritual memories that define who you are in your testimony. And that was one of those for me of like, I have to serve. Mm. 
And so I had that goal for so long, even though I had left the church, even though I had come home. And so that really helped me kind of stay the course. But the most interesting thing is I went back to the mission field January of 2019. And I was there for six days. So <laughs> Did you go back to your same mission? Same anyway? mission, same mission president too. Luckily, he was still there. And I was, there for, I was there for six days because right when I got to the field, I had that same feeling of like, wow, you are not ready. Hmm. And it was, it was so weird because I was like, whoa, I've done all the things. Yeah. It's been 18 months. <laughs> it's been 18 months. Yeah. I, I like to think that I have a, you know, a strong testimony. I like to think that I know that this is true. But that impression was so rock solid. Literally right when I walked into the mission home, I looked at my mission president. I was like, oh, man, I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not ready to be here. And so we talked and then he talked to the area presence, you know, the whole, the whole yeah. shebang. I came home six days later. I, I remember seeing my, my parents face. My dad picks me up from the airport and it wasn't like sadness. It was more like, like a weird deja vu. It was like, <laughs> I just saw you here. <laughs> and so I ended up being home again from January until November of 2019. So like almost ten months. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, this, that you you that is like impressive to be honest. Like at, at this at this point, I've served more time at home since I got my original <laughs> calling than in the mission field. And yeah, it was weird. I remember my my mission president saying to me when I was there for those six days, "You're probably not going to be able to come back." <laughs> like the the likelihood of the church having you come back again is basically zero. But then we met again right before I went home, right before he drove me to the airport, the Pasco airport. Oh, yeah. And right before that, he said, actually, the the area authority who was looking over your case, I don't know exactly how it works, but he said, he made an exception. He says that you can come back for a third time. Third time's the charm. Third time's the charm. And so... That November 5th um, of 2019, I went back to the mission field and I was able to finish. I was able to stay from November all the way, the remainder of my mission, which was about 20 months until last summer. Wow. wow. That is awesome. A fairly unique experience, I would say. So what changed between round two and round three? <laughs> like, did you didn't have that? Same feeling round three, you got there and you were like, okay, feel good. Let's do it. Is that kind of how it went? There was a, a very palpable feeling right when I got to the mission field of like, man, I'm here now. Like I can do this for real. So what changed? My perspective, I think changed the most. Obviously personal worthiness is a big part of, you know, your, your spiritual journey. I did a lot of studying and praying about priesthood power in the church, we hear a lot about priesthood authority, but we don't talk as much about gaining personal priesthood power. And so I studied a lot about that. But the perspective change is I realized what was most important in the church. And I was able to boil things down away from the, the culture and the policy and all the minutia that surrounds the church. And I, I found the real heart of it was just my connection with my Heavenly Father. And once I was able to find that little simple thing to latch on to, everything became so much easier. I became so much more centered and I felt like I had a real purpose. And that purpose was like, guys, there's a father out there. Like he, he's real. And I, I, I know him and I felt him. And because I had that powerful drive, it really helped me to feel ready to serve to my full capacity. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's I, I, fun. I like the conviction that you show. Like, so I think that sometimes when people you know, <clears throat> go through something like this, maybe they're, maybe they come home and like they're hard on themselves or I don't there's know. Definitely some I, of I'm that. sure there's, there's some <laughs> moments like that, but it sounds like you, you feel like you've learned a lot from this and coming like, how, how was it when, how, how did you, I guess, like live your life in between <laughs> These because I, I always think about that. Like, what do you do? You work? Do you just like hang out, go back to school, or spend time reading the scriptures a lot? Was, well, how so was that for you? One of the most interesting things about human nature is that we forget things so quickly. 
Mm-hmm. We're getting deep here. I <laughs> we're going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I always think about the apostles of like right after Christ died, and then they're like, "Sweet, we're done. This is pretty cool. We can just go back to fishing." Like they instantly just went reverted back. And so when I was in the mission field for those first few months in 2017, I was like feeling the spirit. I was going hard. I was like, "Man, this is this is truth. This is real." And I get home, I'm like. Oh, sweet. I can go back to how I was. <laughs> and so that's why it was 18 months. I could have been home for just a couple of weeks for all, you know, for mm-hmm. all I know. But I reverted back to my own laziness, to my own, you know, primordial being, I guess. Your and nets, your fishing nets. My fishing mm-hmm. nets. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen that Elder Holland speech? Yeah. <laughs> Chef's okay. kiss. It's it so good. Hits close to home for yeah. sure. Yeah. But yeah, to answer your question is for those 18 months, the first time I was inactive for lots of that time, which is so strange to come home Mm -hmm. with such a profound spiritual impression that like you need to become worthy. You need to serve with all your might to come home and go inactive. This doesn't really make sense to me. I still don't really understand what happened. But what I spent most of that time doing is I went to work. I did some schooling. I failed at dating like (laughs) (laughs) But always in my mind, I knew that this was going to be a limbo stage. I always knew there's a place I need to be. I need to be back in my mission. So that was always the goal. Did you ever have any challenges with uh, like people in your ward? Or did you ever feel like... Because you know, I think that's part of the challenge when people come home from a mission is like, what's everyone going to think? Yeah. There's, you... a, there's a stigma. There's, there's a stigma sometimes. I, I remember my mom telling me the story of the stake president calling my dad to tell him that I was coming home. And my dad was just heartbroken. The my, first time or second time? The first time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> second time he was just like, well. The second time he was like, oh, Stuart's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. But yeah, he he was very sad from what I understand because my dad had served very faithfully. I have two older brothers who had served very faithfully. And it was definitely a, a destabilizing thing for my my parents for me to come home. And when I came back to my ward, I was going to a family ward. I remember my elders corn president looking at me one Sunday and he's like, give me that weird look. He's like, I thought you were gone. <laughs> <laughs> but lots, lots of people didn't really say anything. There was always that kind of tension there. I think in the church, we have created this narrative that there is a lot of shame. Mm-hmm. When in reality, it is just a narrative. That Of course, there is that. I'm sure it happens to lots of people. But in my experience, the shame of coming home early was mostly self-inflicted. Hmm. My bishop was never mad at me. My elder scorn president was never mad at me. None of my friends were ever like, Stuart, you really failed. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like your thoughts about what you thought other people yeah. were, how they were reacting. But that wasn't necessarily the reality. It's like, have you guys ever heard of the mirror image self? It's like a sociological term, I think. It's like how you see yourself is how you think other people see you. Oh, mm. yeah. And so like, because I thought other people saw me as like a failure, then I became a failure, but other people didn't actually see me. I created that. Yeah. Mm. And, but that really wasn't ever a big part of my, my journey. I never let that really be a focus, but it definitely That's did. That's good. In terms of me just kind of going inactive, that definitely was a part of it. Cause I was like, I had no world. There was no place for me to go. Mm. So I just went to my own, I guess, hid in my cave. And to clarify, they sent you back to the same mission for the third time? All three times. All three times. So were your homies Uh, on the mission, like, super happy to see you every time? (laughs) Like, hey, It's funny. My When I went out in January for those six days, I got retrained in those six days. And my trainer, when he found out I was going home, he was just, like, so sad. Because if you're a trainer of the mission, your trainee is going home, you think it's your you fault. You think you failed or something, yeah. And I'm like, oh, no, like, dude, you have no idea. I've been out before, like, it's okay. But when I got back to the mission 10 months later, he was still there. And he got to be my new companion right when I got there, and he got to retrain oh, me again. And so that was sweet. that was incredible. I mean, that, and then I got to finish off his mission with him, and it was just an incredible experience. Oh, you were his last companion as yeah. well? Oh, that's so cool. That's nice. It all circles back. <laughs> yeah. That's so weird that you that you flew into... Because Pasco was where I came coming home from my mission. <laughs> Maybe you guys, like... that's where you were Crossed leaving. paths. Oh, I'm... I'm a 
much older than that. I came home many, <laughs> many years ago. Oh yeah, that's. I don't know why I. Maybe it's you were. Okay. Maybe you crossed paths like going out of town or something. You never. I was in that airport quite a bit, airport. especially for a missionary. I was there more often than most. I probably was there during some summers while you were there. Anyway, enough reminiscing. <laughs> um, the last time you were out, the the last. The, the, Number three. Number three, my lord. Um, <laughs> Big number three. The third try. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, number three. How was it different than the first two? Like, n- not just when you first got there, but throughout the experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you feel better prepared? There were a million things that I could do now that third time that I could never have done if I had served in 2017. Mm-hmm. Or if I had served in 2014 when I was 18. If I had just gone out like most missionaries at 18, I think I could have done fine. I could have done a great job. Plenty of great 18-year-old missionaries. But there was a depth to my testimony at 25 that I just could not have had. Mm-hmm. And there was a strength of conviction and there was just a whole back catalog of experience that I had, I had intimate experience with the atonement of Jesus Christ. And that allowed me to testify so much more powerfully. And I was in the mission field for about five months, but when COVID hit the whole world and we shut down everything and we had a whole array of our mission leadership all go home and we had tons, our mission shrunk by over a third. And at that moment I was like, this is why the Lord has pushed back my time as a missionary because he knew he needed people with my level of intensity, I guess, to be here when the mission was about to get really hard for lots of missionaries. Mm. And I think that's so important. I think that sometimes missionaries, when they head to the mission, especially at 18, we we tend to undervalue preparing for the mission. Maybe because we don't know how sometimes or, or whatever it may be. But like, it kills me when, you know, I hear missionaries out there say, oh, I've been here five months and I'm just hearing that, that Jesus visited the Americas. What? <laughs> and you're just like, Oh, Oh man. Yeah. Cool. We have is... a pretty good book you could have read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And some don't, haven't even really read the full book till they're on their mission. The yeah. Book of Mormon. Yeah. It's but it's about, that, but... so that preparation I think is really important and, and putting time into that and taking it seriously is, is great. Cause you can go and, and, regardless of whether or not you're prepared, a lot of missionaries go out and they're not prepared and they still have a great experience and a transformative mm-hmm. experience and they find that testimony. Um, but it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, from your experience, it was, no, I need to have this testimony yeah. before I go out and share it with other people because I'm not going out to find it. I'm going out to share it, you know? Mm-hmm. Is that kind of what your mentality was a little bit? Definitely. That was a huge part of it. It was like, if I'm going to go knock on people's doors, I'm going to go bother strangers all day. I really need to know this. I really need to believe it. I have four older brothers. Two of them left the church around the same time I did. And then two of them served missions and got married in the temple. And so I was sitting here kind of at the the crux of this, this fulcrum here of, if I, I could go one way or the other and really nobody would bat an eye. And I was like, well, I need to know this. I need to choose this for myself instead of just going along with it because that's what I knew. Yeah. So that, that conviction made all the difference in my mission. Major respect. I, I, I had a companion who, who I think he got injured and had to go home and then he chose to come back and just like when you go out when you start the mission you don't know what to expect (laughs) right and then you get there and you're like oh this is actually really really hard yeah (laughs) and then you come home from that like early in your case and you come home and you're it 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 makes it 10 times harder to go back out to the field because you know exactly what you're getting into you know Mm -hmm. how hard it's going to be and so my respect for missionaries who leave and come back for whatever reason it's just, it, it's very, there's a lot of respect for, for those who choose to do that. So much. You even come home and you've completed a mission and you still have dreams that you got to go back. I At still have I do. those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think they're called nightmares. Nightmares. <laughs> and I, I don't see that dreams. to scare anyone from going on a mission. It's not that. It's just, 
It's I don't hard. Know. You just gotta. You know, once you've done it, it's just it's hard. Yeah, it's hard, and it pushes but you I out won't of change your... it for the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think we could probably all three agree on that. Like, it's mm-hmm. so hard, but but so transformative. And uh, yeah, you wouldn't change it for anything. I mean, I I have regrets. I have things that I wish I didn't do, or things that I wish I did better. But they they transform you into who you are today. And you have terrible dreams about, you know, still <laughs> being sent back forever. But you're still so grateful that you went. Mm-hmm. I love this tangent we've gone on. <laughs> anyway, do you do you have any parting words of just advice yeah. for anyone who might be going through something similar? One of my roommates around this time last year at BYU. He had gone to the MTC, I believe, and had, I think he had an anxiety attack and he came home and then he just decided to finish the rest of his degree. He's been home. He's like, I think he's in his mid twenties. And I remember one day we were just sitting there brushing our teeth and he's like, Stuart, you were an old missionary, weren't you? And I was like, <laughs> like, it's not something I tell everybody, but yeah, sure. And he's like, what would you recommend that I go back now that I'm done with school? And I, I literally remember like sitting there and taking my toothbrush out of my mouth and putting it back in the sink and being like, like Andrew, yes, like 100%. There is like no greater laboratory for the formation of your testimony than a mission. And I, I used this analogy the other day with my little sister. She's not anywhere near a mission, but I was ranting to her one day. I said, imagine that you were sent to a foreign country or to another state or whatever for two years and you couldn't talk to your family and you couldn't watch YouTube videos. And for her, you can't go on TikTok and you you can't read whatever you want. All you can do all day is paint. It's all you can do. And you can only read books about painting, only approved books about painting. And you can go walk the streets and you can tell everyone about painting. And if you study Monet all day, Eventually, after 18 months or two years, everything you see will be filtered through this prism of Monet. You'll see everything as a painting. And you won't be able to see anything else. And if you swap out that experience of painting with serving other people, imagine what it will do to your life if every day, for two years, 18 months, however long, for me, four years, if every day was filtered through this prism of you're going to go out and you are just going to help people because you love people. And I, now I've been home for about a year and a half, a little less. And I still see everything through that prism of today, I'm going to go out and I'm going to help people. Not because I can get something from them, not because I'm some great person, but just because I love my Heavenly Father and that's what He would do if He was right here. And I don't think... You can learn that to that degree in any other experience besides a mission. So I would say to everybody to serve a mission. It'll, yes. it'll change the way you see your entire life. I yep. completely agree. Yep. Fantastic I, analogy. We can all testify of that. Yeah. It, it changes you. Well, Stuart, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. We're really happy to have had you on the show. And if anyone has questions for him in the comments, please let us know. You, you can check it out. Or if you want, people can like follow him on Instagram. We can shamelessly plug your Instagram. <laughs> Whatever you want, we can put it down in the description. There you go. But anyway, thank you again. Thank and you. thank you all for joining us today. Bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. 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 I'm Julie Guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you get all these references. I know. That's great. <laughs>